Hello my friend, and welcome back to the next installment of the version 5 faction overviews for Divide and Conquer. And this week, honestly, this is my favorite faction, bar none. I, I probably have said it about other factions, but I love this faction the most from anyone in the mod. And I think it's also probably a fan favorite. We are on Dorwinian, a very interesting faction because for lore, there isn't really much. All that is really written about the lands of Dorwinian is that some very fine, fine wine comes here, and that is written in The Hobbit where Thranduil and the elves are drinking the wines from Dorwinian, and it is strong enough to get elves drunk, which most maids are unable to do. So that is literally it for the peoples of Dorwinian and the little bit of lore that they have. There is more lore for the Avari elves. The Avari are the elves that basically rejected taking the journey to Valinor to see the light of the two trees, and so they are the Avari, or the Dark Elves, and I'll get more into their characters here shortly. So, to start off, we have settlements. So, Darwinian, you start with four settlements. So, you have Seth and we, a stronghold, Strondost, a castle here in your south, Harasant, your capital, a very wealthy settlement here in the north, and to the east on the island of Nabur, we have Naburka, just a small village with an interesting general position there. So that is it for your starting settlements. Four is not too bad, kind of in the, I guess you could say probably average for most factions are about four or five, give or take, minus the big ones like, you know, obviously Mordor and Gondor and all of that. So you have four starting provinces. Uh, for your characters, we'll just go down the list with our faction leader, Vine Regent Halwyn, who starts off in Karasant. He has a standard uh, bodyguard of Dorinian, but he does come with a um, unique biography and some unique retinue there. So it makes him a little bit unique. He also has the Iron Fist special ability, so it's always good to have generals with those abilities. Faction heir is Vine Lord Swain, same bodyguard, the... Uh, Dorinian Paladins, he is positioned here in Sant Anui. Orthwin is planted at the Castle of Strondost. He is the Grand Master of Strondost, so this is where he and his family reside from. And he has a bit of a story here, um, so it's pretty interesting that he also has a background. Uh, for the other characters, we have Athol here, who is just a ranger general over in Nabur. He has the master of Nabur ancillary. Uh, no biography on him, but he does have leadership. So kind of four command stars. So he's actually not that great at being a general, <laughs> to be honest. And then we have Nurray, the final general that you start with. And he is positioned at the fort just north of Sant Anui. Having a biography, being an elf, house of Nurray and Avari. And for your only starting agent, you have Morway. So it is written in the Legendarium that the leaders of the Avari people, there were the elves under Morway, who is represented by him here as the diplomat, and the elves under Norway. And I think Norway's yes. people was, were called like the Nelvari or something like that. Nelvar. Uh, so he is of them. I could be mistaken there name there so i believe the implement the implementation is that norway and morway over here yes. are from the first age and they are the original like clan leaders i guess you could say for the avari elves though it could also just be that their names were chosen because they were leaders in the past and when galadarathon or the modding team put them in it could be that they were min merely just adopting the namesake, but I like to believe that these are the original leaders, which kind of puts Norway up there in terms of age with those th with the likes of like um, Thranduil's father, Elrond, uh, Galadriel. Like it kind of puts them higher up on the uh, Elven uh, respect list, I guess you could say. So that is it for your starting generals for expansion. You have quite a few options to your west. All of Rovanion starts off as rebel territory, all the way up to the woods where you might reach Dorgoldur. But you have plenty of settlements. Ilanin, Carverat, Raburg, Burr Southis, Logarth, Vilter, to the south, Dorthalu, Osinarai, and finally, Morded Helen, an important settlement that we'll get into shortly here. To the eastern side, you are basically stuck with a neutral enemy, which is Rune. They will definitely attack you at some point, and do note that they have a starting full-stack army that 
pretty much starts off in the west and they always seem to walk southward so you typically don't have to fight them or anything but just don't be afraid if you see this massive uh runic stack there they tend to go elsewhere with them and to the north you have a few options also should you use your starting ship admiral erland who doesn't have any like special uh, ancillaries or anything he's a poor navigator but he's a fleet admiral so he's not doing so hot it does give you the option though to take your troops up to condovan Burmar Lynch is also open for expansion, and Winterian Eeyore. So three settlements to your north. If you really wanted to, you could go fight Dale. I don't know why you would, or you can go fight the dwarves. But maybe you want to play a campaign where you actually ally with the Easterlings, and then you have that option. So overall, plenty of rebel options. Looking at the map, too, I mean, you appear to have the most options for uh, rebel territory. You and uh, Dorgaldur over here, when you play as the player, and only have Dorgaldur. Um, but that's about it for Rebel Expansion. Uh, of course, you can see we're on turn two, so the Easterlings do have Lest and Burr and Monarchus. All the way up to Rubar on the east, they do not have Winteri and Eeyore. But they do have everything in the south, Madaram and Mahad uh, and Varfest. So Rune will be your predominant enemy. You can pretty much rush them and go across the Sea of Rune, take Mistran, take Lest. But they will gain a kind of a last stand stack army should you take uh mistran so there's a bit of an anti-rush incentive there you want to be strong enough to take them uh, if you're going to go push out that way just be be forewarned that is so now we'll go into the real meat of the expansion and that is morned hell the prized and crown jewel of Dorwinian in version 4.5 this is an elven large city that is very defensible as any armies that want to attack it have to go up one of these roads past the fort which you could garrison and then all the way to Mornet hell it does not have any access from strondost or lest or to the south it only borders uh sant ennui carverad vilter ostenarai and it even though it technically borders for a monarchist it's not going to reach trade with them as there's no crossing over there so taking Mornet hell is the key to your faction scripts so instead of it being like it was in version 4.6, where around turn 63 or something like that, you would be given the option to choose between the human infantry or like the elven army choices, and then you'd have different building options for those. Now it is strictly tied to taking more than hell. So as soon as you take it, you are granted the option. So do note there is a 10 stack, uh, I guess half stack army that is positioned here of Easterlings. The army isn't too terribly strong. It's mostly like Daratai warriors, Daratai clansmen. There should be a couple of crossbows in there. And the general is either a Dragon's Wrath guildsman or it's a Loxion rim. I can't quite remember off the top of my head. I want to say Dragon's Wrath guildsman. So it is a somewhat strong army here, but not too difficult to actually conquer the city. And you'll find that the walls, it kind of shares the appearance of some of the high elven settlements as well. I think it used to be like Mythwall's battle map, where it's kind of got like a large, wide, circular wall with like a hillside to the right of it. So there's like a like a hill blocking one of the walls. You guys might know the settlement I'm talking about. I won't show it here, but it's it's a fun settlement to attack and it's a fun settlement to defend from, is what I am trying to say. So we'll go into the basically what you get from the scripts. So I have actually two saves where I go into that. So I'm going to go ahead and pop over to the human side real fast. And so here we are on the human side where you basically tell the elves that, hey, I want you to work the economy, work the farms, so that all of the men can take up arms and fight in war. So your first unlock from that is you do get Edward in. He is right here and he comes with a very powerful bodyguard and his own biography. No special ability on him, however. He does have the Vintner Court Paladins, a 14 attack, 23 defense, skilled against mounts, cavalry unit, so you will unlock Edwardin when you choose the Elven Path. Additionally, in all of your settlements that are towns or cities, you may build the Avari Trader Sub, which just gives you additional trade income, and for all of the Darwinian Heartland settlements, if I go here, you can get the Avari Market, which will give you recruitment of Privateer Cavalry and the recruitment of a Merchant for every Avari Market you have. So you can get those in Mordenhell, uh, Karasant. You can't get them in saint Anui because it is a Stronghold. You can't get it in Strondos either for the same reason as it is a Castle. 
but you can get them in Naburka. So you can train that and get quite a few merchants out. So actually, you can't... Actually, can you not get them over here? I thought the merchant was available everywhere. Okay, you only get the merchant from Morned Hell. So my apology there. I thought it was everywhere, but you only get the merchant from Morned Hell. I think that should be in all three settlements. It's really not that, that powerful. I'm going to petition for that on the side. So you do get a merchant in Morned Hell for the time being. And the Avari Traders Hub is a global building. So you can get that anywhere. Like if you were in Gondor, you'd be able to break, um, put that if you were... Anywhere in the world, as long as it's a town or settlement, you will have the first tier of that. And then in addition to that, you also unlock the Windan Palace, which is quite expensive, but very much worth it. Trade income, a lot of public order, and 450 building income for building the palace. It does only have one tier, but it'll also allow you to retrain the forces under Avalon's command. So... The way that works is after you've taken Morned Hell and have 12 total regions, regardless of your choice, you will get the other generals. So on the human choice, after 12 regions, you will get Avalon, and he will come with a an army consisting of each Elven Avari unit that you are unable to recruit, and those can then be retrained at Morned Hell. For the Elven side, when we get there, Edwin will spawn after 12 settlements with Morned Hell with all of the regents units and the privateers. Um, and Vintner Court, Knights and Paladins, and he can be retrained in Santa and Weaver. We'll get to there shortly. In addition to the human side, you'll also unlock, well, pretty much all of the human units, which are through a singular barracks now. If we go here to the Regent's Armory, uh, you do get Athala Rangers, Regent Bowguard, Regent Axe Guard, Spear Guard, Vintner Court Knights, and Vintner Court Paladins. So these uh, six units here, are not available if you choose to have the elves supplement your military instead. And then that is pretty much it for the human side there. I will now switch over to uh, the elven side to show the bonuses that they get. So now we're here at the elven side. So when you decide to have the elves and the avari take up arms to help you in war, you will unlock Avalon as your first general. And like I said, Edwin will show up later in your campaign. Avalon is a very powerful general like Edwin. However, he is a horse archer, fully kitted out with the melee attack upgrades and defense upgrades. 12 melee, 7 missile attack, 20 total defense. Very, very, very powerful cavalry unit with a bonus against the Easterling Cataphract Cavalry, which is quite interesting to see there. He does not have a special ability as far as I'm aware. No, he does not. But he does have the biography bonus, giving him extra hit points and all the other good traits. Authority, renown, command, movement, and personal security. So the other thing that you will get by having the elves fight for you is you will unlock the Avari Academy, which at tier 1 reduces training costs, gives a morale bonus, and provides 4 recruitment slots. And going to tier 2, a plus 6 morale bonus with 6 recruitment slots. So... That allows you to pump out many, many troops at once. Additionally, this also is the structure that will allow you to retrain Edwin's retinue once he joins you. And I'm pretty sure, I know his army comes with one of each of the Regents unit, and it'll have an Athala Ranger and the Infantry Vintner Court uh, Knights. He might come with his own second unit of Paladins, but I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head how many units he exactly gets. But Edwin would have all of the Avari and Morquendi units, so you at least still get to have them. Only in a restricted format, though, where it's almost like they're a mercenary band, if you think about it. It's actually kind of interesting. I kind of like that, even though I think it'd be better just to have the full roster unlocked at some point in the campaign. I think it's kind of nice having, like, a mercenary band of the elves. And then finally, for that, you get the Tier 5 Blacksmith, the Avari Armor, giving you Avari Plates. If you have the Elves work the economy, you only get up to the Tier 4 Armor. And then checking the Barracks for the Avari Elves, you will, at the last tier, unlock the Shadows, Spearmen, Warriors, Naharim, Moraquendi Sentinels, and Moraquendi Protectors. So each of the branches does come with 6 units in the Barracks. I did forget to mention, and I'm remembering now on the human side, let's see if it shows it in here, the woodland camps. Uh, if you are in a forested region and you have had the humans take up war and the elves take up trade, anywhere with the forest, you can put the hunting camp and the lumber camp 
to get the Woodland Hunters and the Lumbermen. Honestly, the Lumbermen, not too fancy, but it is just an additional unit, plus the Privateer Cavalry at the, uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name, what is it? Uh, the Avarin Traders Market, that's what it was. So outside of that, you have no other restrictions to your buildings, standard Tier 4 or Tier 5, standard uh, ports you can get up to the Dark Yard, though you only get long ships here, so it's just the same type of boats, standard livestock uh, farming. For guilds, you do get two, one being the Merchant's Guild, of which you can get the Headquarters to get a Merchant or the Master's Guild to do so, and the Warrior's Guild, which starts off as the Weaponsmith Guild, and then the Avarin Smith Guild, which will give you a global morale bonus, which, to be honest, I've never found is that useful, uh, but they will, these guilds will allow you to retrain your infantry quicker in your settlements, like all of the other guilds. Finally, for other unique buildings, all of Darwinian in regions where there is the wine resource, which I believe is, it's not that one, it's this guy right here, the vineyard. You can get the winery, which comes with 65 income, trade, culture, and happiness, which then upgrades to the Vintner's Guildhouse, an excellent building, 250 income, additional population growth, it, probably because of the wine, we, we know what wine does. 2% uh, culture increase and additional public order happiness. So it's a great building. I highly recommend anywhere that you go that has the wine resource, get the winery. It can be a little expensive at first, six turns, 3,800 gold, but I mean, you get a few construction halls and this thing is pretty cheap and worth it. In addition for mining income, you do have mines in Sant and We. Uh, they are in Mornatel also at 160. Grandaz also has mines and it has a gold resource, so it's a good idea to get the mines here. So it's 240 base income. Uh, Karasant doesn't have them, but doesn't really need them. Additionally, you do get the Merchant's Wharf for trading since you are a very trade focused faction and you have the ability to unlock uh, banks once you have built up your markets enough. So, Darwinian. Very much an economic powerhouse, especially around the Sea of Rune. Should you be able to control this land, you will fill up your coffers with immense, immense gold. It's it's kind of crazy how much money you can make by capitalizing or monopolizing the entirety of the Sea of Rune. You will be very, very rich. And you do have Naburka to work as a early power base. Population is pretty low, I'd recommend. Turn that thing to low, try to get chicken farming if you can there it already has land clearance so it's as good as it's going to get once you have chicken farming uh and once it does have walls it's a bit easier to defend but you won't be able to really recruit anything here until you actually bring it up to a town because the thorn barracks does require a town um though you can get your levies at least from the meeting hall and you can get a militia garrison to help you defend here um, I would just rush for population growth in the Burka, level it up, and then it gives you a good staging grounds to basically go either to Mistrand, Elgire, Rubar, or Winterian Ore. It's definitely possible to win the naval game here with Rune, though you do have to know that they also have ports at Lust, a port at Mistrand, and there should be, yes, a port here at Winterian Ore, which is neutral, I believe. The Rubar and the Elgire... Uh, ports were removed to kind of weaken the economy here, but there used to be two ports there. In fact, actually, Rubar, Rubar still has it. It has a fishing village, but Elgire no longer has the port, as this is just the fishery resource, and this is the actual port there. So that's pretty much it for Darwinian's campaign uh, map overview. I definitely recommend you're going to want to take Carverad. It's a decent settlement to have next to Santa and we Take Carverad. Have Norway with his forces take Elanen. You could oftentimes get Ravanian mercenaries, like I bet right now I can get, yeah, Ravanian hunters, Ravanian spearmen, and Ravanian riders. Just decent, cheap, very cheap mercenaries, actually. I mean, 158 for the hunters is incredible. It's, I don't even know why they are that cheap, but they are. So very cheap and effective Ravanian units. Have Norway siege out Elanen and take that over. Uh, ideally have your faction leader, who I have now moved over to Mornadhel, yeah. have Swain go take Carverad, move down to Viltur, and from there, if you want to push out farther, you can. It might not be a bad idea to grab Robert for the additional income, and Logarth makes for an excellent western castle to act as a front against Dorgoldur over here in your west, and to, uh, 
the Easterlings in the south. But once you've taken Vilter, kind of just expect this entire line to be a lot of battles with uh, Rune. You can easily take less here at Strondos, and it is very easy to defend here at this bridge. You can park an army here. I recommend make sure that this fort always has at least four healthy units in you to help you defend this area. Hold the bridge if you can. You could just stay in the castle, but do note that the river here does not extend all the way up to the mountain. It's more of a small creek. So if armies make it past the bridge, they can just simply walk up here and then walk into your heartland. So that is something to be a note of. And I guess I didn't go into the starting armies, but I'll just go into that. Fourth one, his bodyguard is the Regent Spearguard, uh, a unit of Thorn Bladesman and Thorn Guard here. In Karasant, you just have the Vineyard Levies along with Fine Regent Halwyn, who has the High Paladins as his bodyguard. And over in Santanui, you have a Thorn Crosswoman and a Thorn Bladesman, along with Vine Lord Swain, who also only has the standard bodyguard. And with Norway, he also comes with Avari Warriors, Avari Spearmen, and Avari Shadows. And his bodyguard is the Morquendi Sentinels. So that's pretty much it for the campaign overview. I will now take it over to the battle map, and we have quite a bit to go over there. And welcome to the battle map. And I'm going to do this in kind of two parts. One is going to show all of the units that you can get regardless of choice. So this is your standard core roster. And then I will show their armor upgrades who I have here in group three. And then I'm going to do a, another part where I'm going to show the um, human units and then the elven units that you get from each of the branching paths. Because I did want to show the regular units first with their armor upgrades because it does look really really cool in my opinion and i love the progression here so starting off with your meeting hall units your very very basic militia first off are the vineyard levies who have new voice lines all across the faction which are pretty nice i'll make sure to click on units a few times so you guys can hear those i just thought that was interesting anyway these are your standard Two attack, six defense, spear unit, good against mounts, but terrible morale. Pretty much just use them as you would any cheap spear unit. They can hold the line relatively well for a while until better units can go support them. They are great to use to basically take arrow fire or to throw at enemy cavalry. Uh, even if you have to rush them into melee and not let them brace the charge, that's totally fine. They are quite expendable, um, but given that 6 defense, they are able to hold for a while. And I do really like the kind of oval kite shield design that these guys have. But outside of that, I mean, standard cheap spears. We all know how to use standard cheap spears, and I'm not going to blab on them, as I usually do with the trash. <laughs> anyway, the Vineyard Bowmen are next, and they are your... They are a 2 2 2 3 unit for the archers, so 2 melee, 2 missile, 2 charge, 3 total defense, only 18 missiles, 150 meter range with low accuracy and poor morale. Uh, in numbers, they can do okay. Uh, up against your primary enemies being the Easterlings, the Vineyard Bowmen won't be that uh, useful. Really, you'll probably just use them to counter fire against like Balkoth Javelin Men or to shoot at. Daratai archers, like the Daratai clan hunters, but Rune does not lack heavy and medium armor, so often it might not be worth it to really use the Vineyard Bowmen or expect much out of them, though it can be said that having any archer at all is better than not having an archer, and of course these guys could be quite valuable on a bridge battle or any siege defense, so... They find some use there, though, in general, you are not much of an archer nation outside of the elves. The elves give you good archer options, but for the average tier, you don't get much. So those are the vineyard bowmen, just trash archers. Uh, you have better options that are available to you and that you should use. And they come from the second tier here. And these are the thorn units. So the thorn units come from the thorn barracks, the tier one. So starting off are the Thorn Guard. These guys are halberd units, even though they kind of look like pikemen. They have 3-3 three, three with 9 defense, being that they are halberds. They are effective against armor and effective against mounts. Average morale, average morale response, and they're also good against all types of camels and wargs and elephants. Uh, do note that they do not receive charges that well. You might think to put these guys in like guard mode with spear wall 
And you might think that they could take the charge from an R-led Dragon Rider, which is kind of ruins main early tier cavalry. No, no, they, they actually, they don't. They do not take charges that well. And it is my biggest annoyance with these types of halberd units is that they just are not equipped to withstand a cavalry charge. They will basically, I mean, they'll kill cavalry, but they won't take the charge well. So just keep that in mind. Ideally, you'll want like a spear unit to take the charge or to have your own cavalry support them and then let these guys run into melee after the charge has committed and they will just absolutely slaughter heavy cavalry so a great unit just don't use them as a front line against cavalry they they just don't do that well as you might think they will next to them we have the thorn crossbowmen so your first real meat and potatoes archer unit Three attack, six um, six missile attack. That is armor piercing because they are crossbows and six total defense. Average accuracy with a, a 26 meters. Uh, no, sorry, 26 missiles, 140 meter range. Um, pretty solid unit, honestly. Uh, the range and accuracy may leave some work to be desired, but if you can get them close range and keep them protected, they will get lots of kills, especially against heavily armored runic units like Lok Flagrim, Lok Scion Rim, Dragon's Wrath Guildsmen. A volley from these crossbowmen will do immense damage to Easterling Cataphract Cavalry, and should you have to fight Dogal or Nazgul, you'll find that the crossbowmen are great. But one thing that crossbowmen are really good at are being like general assassins if you need a ranged unit to kill a general real quick have the crossbows just unleash a volley on him when his bodyguard is basically all dead and most of the time the general will be um, killed by a volley of bolts so a great crossbow unit just keep them away from cavalry being that they are crossbows they have the vulnerability of a very long reload time so if they are caught in a bad position and they get charged there's not much that they can do about it um, oftentimes you can find that putting them in guard mode still allows them to get a volley off even if they get uh, engaged in melee but not always so just keep that in mind it usually works out if they have another target a uh, solid unit and i definitely recommend recruit plenty of these and my favorite units in the roster my bread and butter even though these are really just gondor militia at six and ten the thorn bladesmen they are average morale average morale response all that good stuff but the one thing they have going for them is they have Shield Wall, which gives them a lot of utility in taking cavalry charges, pushing into enemy formations, or just having a very compact formation themselves. Obviously, don't do this if you're being shot by artillery, but it can be very powerful to have your own, basically, Testudo block of Thorn Bladesmen. Um, oftentimes, these guys are great for pushing into a settlement, like at the gates, to basically make room for your army to all push and that is brilliant throw on some armor upgrades and weapon upgrades to these guys and they actually start to get very deadly i mean one chevron and one weapon upgrade they're at eight attack and with their armor upgrades they're at 13 defense which is actually pretty solid for such a cheap um, mainline core unit one of my favorites and i often find them getting many many kills in my army so that could just be the state of affairs given that you're fighting and sometimes weaker units around you, but I definitely recommend get a lot of Thorn Bladesmen and get a lot of Thorn Crossbowmen and have like the odd Thorn Guard, just a couple of them here and there, and you'll have a very solid army if you can pad that in with some Vineyard Levies. You've got a great starter force in all five of these units. They all kind of complement each other very well. The Levies cover the cavalry, the Thorn Guard can deal with heavy armor, the Bladesmen take care of most infantry. And then the two archers here can cover each other. The Finyard Bowmen can fire at enemy archers to allow the crosswomen to focus their damage on enemy heavy infantry. So that's it for the early tiers there. We go into tier 2 and you get two unlocks. Um, only in Dorinian regions though. So only in like Rovanian and Dorinian. First off are the Dorinian Swordmasters. These used to be the Dorinian Armsmen. They have now been lowered to tier 2 and their stats have taken a hit for that. They are a hybrid man and elf unit. As you can see here, the men and the elves fight together. Looking at their stats, they are a 9 attack, 8 charge, and 12 total defense. So better offensive and defensive stats than the uh, Thorn Bladesmen for just the next tier up above. And they don't cost all that much more to use. I want to say their upkeep is around 295, I want to say. And the Thorn Bladesmen are like 205 or maybe 255. Somewhere around that region, I wish the upkeep costs would 
show here, but instead it only shows the recruitment slots. Uh, recruitment slots, what am I saying? I'm sorry, guys, it's been a long week. <laughs> uh, recruitment cost. Uh, but they are a formidable unit, just don't let them get charged, don't let them get shot by runic crossbows, and they'll be able to get a decent amount of kills for you and your armies. And then next to them we have the Darwinian Infantry, these are your upgraded Vineyard Levies. Again, a hybrid man and elf unit, which I just, I really love that, I think that's so cool to have these two different models here. They're a 5, 6, and 15 total defense, so a bit better than... Other spear infantry you might see around this tier, you might see a lot of 414s in a lot of units. Like, I think the Dalian Ravanian Godrots were like 414s, if I'm not mistaken. They might have been 515s. But very solid unit. I love the purple coloring on them. This is where the morale starts to get good. And they have a bonus against all types of mounts, except for elephants. Uh, but, you know, just keep them away from elephants and you won't have a problem. They also have the shield wall, so they share that with the Blazemen, allowing them to take charges even better, or be an offensive um, powerhouse. And then finally, we have the High Paladins. I have them both here with the armor upgrade, but there's no visual upgrade for them anymore. If you remember, in version 4.6, the armor that the Elf here is wearing used to be the armor for the whole unit, but they are now a hybrid unit again, like the Darwinian Swordmasters and the Infantry. So they are a 14 attack, 25 defense, two-handed uh, swords unit bodyguard. Trying to think, are there other standard two-handed bodyguards in the mod? I don't, like, I, I'm going to say I don't think there are, and then it's going to turn out there is, and I'm going to try to run through the bases. I know the High Elves don't, because they have Calaquendi Lords, uh, so I know it's not them. Uh, Bree obviously doesn't. You can make a case that, like, the Dunedain use two-handed axes, but for dedicated, like, two-handed sword infantry... Ended wife has it, but they throw javelins. Uh, so I want to say... Well, I guess, oh, Gundab uh, Gundabad. Gundabad's the other faction that uses two-handed swords. So Gundabad and Dorinian have two-handed sword bodyguards. Nothing too special outside of there. They will fight very well in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the runic bodyguards. And I remember a really cool time where I actually had a battle where the uh, runic bodyguard was nearly defeated along with the high paladins. And it was literally my general of Dorwinian, like, I want to say it was probably Vinelord Swain, took down the runic general, like, his actual model in hand-to-hand -hand combat and got, like, a kill animation on him. And I thought that was, like, really, really cool to see the two general units fight against each other. So, very good stats, 14 and 25. They are very powerful. Just no shield makes them vulnerable to runic crossbows. But outside of that, they are a very formidable unit. Now we'll get to the fun stuff with the armor upgrades. So these are the armor upgrades that you'll get. In fact, I forgot the cavalry. We'll come back to them. We'll take a break to look at the visuals. The thorn guard here in the... Pretty much you're going to see this red and gold armor with the vineyard symbols all across the units. And they all take up new weapons, which I think is really cool. They get these elven blades. The crossbows even take on this red look to them instead of being kind of like the orange wood that they were. We go over here to the Thorn Bladesman, and they get the really cool vineyard emblems on the shields that have now tur turned gold. So in a way, they've basically become like, you, honestly, you're you're the new Easterlings. The red and gold is taking up with your faction. The Dorinian Infantry over here, also with the vineyard symbology over red shields, the golden, the golden plate mail. Uh, the elves don't wear helmets, so that you can tell that they're elves easier, and the men are wearing helmets. And then finally, the Dorinian Swordmasters taking up the Elven Curved Blades. Again, keeping that motif where the Elves don't wear the helmets, but the men do. And I guess since we're here, we'll just talk about the Cavalry. I'll just bring these guys over here. So, here, the first unit, the Thorn... Uh, well, I guess we'll do Thorn Riders first. So, uh, this is such a mess. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, the Thorn Riders, here is their base look with the Spears and then the upgraded look. They take on the Elven full arm. So looking at these guys, we'll look at the base stats first. A 4 attack, 6 charge, with 9 total defense. They do switch to their sword, which actually has one more attack than their spear. So they go up to 5 attack when they're in dedicated melee combat. And these guys have curved Elven blades with the visual upgrade. An excellent early cavalry unit. They do have a bonus against Easterling Cataphract Cavalry, but they are immensely outclassed. You are probably not going to want to send them one-on-one -on -one against the Cataphract Cavalry. But if you can have maybe two of them engaged, you I think you might win. I haven't tested that out, but I, 
I know for a fact, one-on-one, -on -one, the Thorn Riders are not going to beat Easterling Cataphract Cavalry, but maybe two-on-one -on -one with the upgrades, they might actually fare well in that battle, given their unique bonus. Um, I'm just a big fan of that polearm. I love that. And then for the other option, a very rare unit in the mod, we have the Thorn Patroller. So I'm just going to show the version here. We'll look at the stats. They are a 4, 7, and 6 with 18 missiles. Low range, only 110 meters with average accuracy. However, being the fact that they are mounted crossbows, that range doesn't really matter because they can get in close. They can fire their payload, and then run away. They don't suffer the penalty of a foot crossbow unit for having to stay in place for so long, which makes the Thorn Patrollers very, very excellent at their job. They are great at skirmishing against Runic Cavalry, because Runic Cavalry do not come with shields outside of the Cataphracts. The Cataphracts do, but the um, Aralad don't. And even the Cataphracts will take casualties from these guys with enough time. So, a very good unit. You're going to want to get some of these guys... Um, honestly, the cavalry for Derwinian is your early game bread and butter along with the Thorn units, but especially the Thorn patrollers for taking out high value targets safely and skirmishing early with your enemy. So a great and fantastic unit. You only see war or you only see mounted crossbows with Derwinian and with the goblins of Moria when we get to them later. So it's a rare unit, but a very nice one to have. And I just realized this video is going to be quite long because there's a lot to go through with Derwinian. So I'm going to go ahead and now load up a battle with all of the Regents units and the Avari units. And now we are back here. So first off, we're going to talk about the human units, and then we're going to talk about the Elven military units. So starting off first are the Regent Bogard. These are a direct upgrade to the Thorin Crossbowmen going up to 6 melee, 10 missile attack with 15 total defense. They do have 26 bolts and 150 meter range with high accuracy, so they are very potent and very deadly. Not a contender for the best crossbow unit in the game, but for a rank and file kind of tier 3 and above unit, they are very, very respectable. And if you choose for the men to fight for your military, you're going to want to get a lot of the Regent uh, Bogar to really make use of their excellent crossbow skills. Uh, next to them, the Regent Axe Guard giving you a solid medium to heavy armored uh, shock infantry unit. The Regent Axemen have 8 attack with a 7 charge and 15 total defense. A bonus against elephants, which will only really apply against Mordor and their great beasts. And I guess technically chariots are considered elephants also, so against Rune you might have some use there. But predominantly you're going to want these guys to rear charge the Runic Heavy Infantry or Pike Blocks, and pretty much every man on the charge is going to kill someone else on the other end of that axe more or less so a solid axe unit a little bit squishy only 15 total defense kind of comparable to harondor axemen but it does give you a nice uh heavy uh shock unit that you can regularly recruit from any of your barracks if you choose for the men to go to war and lastly on the tier are the regent spear guard the next upgrade to the Darwinian Infantry, they are a 6 attack and 20 defense, so plus 1 more attack than the uh, Darwinian Infantry, and 5 more total defense. Again, they have the shield wall just like the Darwinian Infantry, so they can be excellent uh, anchors and stopping points. Um, outside of that, nothing, nothing too more, you know, too much else to say. They are spearmen. And this is where I've realized I have an issue where I talk about the trash spearmen so much, and then I get to the good spearmen, and I'm like... Yeah, they're spearmen, just use them as you put spears, but these guys will actually hold the line for a very, very long time. So if you want to fill out the centers of your formations with a line of Regent Spear Guards and support that with crossbows, your line and your men will survive for a very, very long time, giving you a lot of time to actually get the damage done with your crossbows. So an excellent spear unit, not the best spear unit in the game, but it is your best individual spear unit that you can recruit outside of an elven example that we'll get to shortly here and then the next tier we have the athala rangers i guess they still fit in this tier uh they do give you a very very solid ranger unit we talked about them in the dale video i'll just talk about them briefly again here these are the rangers with the largest accuracy um or in a highest range and highest movement speed i believe of any ranger um in the mod so they are excellent at skirmishing and doing a lot of damage before your uh, battle lines ever 
truly meet. So a great unit to have and an interesting one only found in like the Ringan regions and Ravanian. And then going into the very heavy infantry, we'll start with the mount the dismounted variant who come with stakes. These are the Vintner Court Knights. So an excellent unit, 12 attack, 25 total defense. Very good morale, very good morale response. They are absolute murder machines. Just imagine these guys, I mean, they're Thorn Swordsmen, like, or Thorn Bladesmen on, you know, steroids, basically. They are very powerful. Just keep them away from, like, Cataphract Cavalry, and uh, they are excellent in sieges for uh, fighting in streets or taking the walls. They will do very well, although you don't want them to get shot too much by, like, towers and that sort of thing. An excellent, excellent anchor to your battle lines, and just a beautiful model, too. I've always been a big fan of the purple, the steel, and the gold trim on the shield. So, Vintner Court Knights, an excellent unit, and then next to them, the mounted option, the Vintner Court Paladin. So, a 51-man strong bodyguard, same stats, 12 attack, uh, 23 defense instead of 25. So, they just lose a bit on the shield there for being a mounted unit. But I love the barding on the seeds, like the, the cloth that the horses are wearing. I just think that looks really, really good. And it's too bad the banner carrier has the uh, thorn look there and not some better better look than that. But they are a very, very powerful and tanky cavalry unit. Uh, they have a bonus in general against horses, but they don't have a specific bonus against the cataphract cavalry. If you're going to fight the, cataf the cataphract, it's a good idea to have the Vintner Court Paladins take them head on while the Thorn Riders go in from the flank and use their spears to hopefully slay the Cataphracts swiftly. So that is it for the man units. I didn't cover the Lumbermen or the Woodman Hunters. I believe I went over those in, in the brief video. Nothing too special about them. I mean, they're kind of kind of just a bonus choice. And I'm also not going to talk about the Privateer Cavalry that you get, because I talked about them in the brief line video also. So now for the elves, and we're finally reaching the end here. So for the first tiers of units, you have the Avari Warriors and the Avari Spearmen. So the Avari Warriors are an 11 attack, 20 defense unit. They can hide. Uh, pretty much they're good at hiding in the woods, so they can't hide anywhere. So they're not excellent at ambushing, uh, but they are very fast with 110 movement speed. And some of them are dual wielding swords and daggers. Some have shields. They do have a shield value, though it is only two. Primarily, these elves rely on their armor and a relatively high defense skill of 8. So they're not good at taking arrows, but they are very good at holding their own uh, in melee. So an excellent unit. I'm a big fan of them. Next to them are the Avari Spearmen. Pretty much just take the Avari Warriors, give them a spear instead for melee and a javelin. So 8 melee attack. They're actually better than the uh, Regent Spear Guard in every way now that I think about it. They have less men, per, uh, less men per battalion, but the fact that they have an armor-piercing javelin, three of them with high accuracy and 65 meter range, they make for an excellent, excellent front line, or you can use them with their speed to skirmish and throw javelins into the flanks of your enemies. It's really up to you. I find it'd be more effective to throw, to use these guys as skirmishers and throw javelins to the backs of shielded foes. You don't have to worry about that. Or to save the javelins for things like cavalry and other heavy units, the Avari Spearmen will do excellent at slaughtering them. So great units. Uh, I do know you can sometimes pick them up as mercenaries. And for any elven faction in Darwinian or Ravanian, they can actually recruit these guys as mercenaries as well. So Thranduil is able to get Avari Spearmen. Uh, Lorien is able to do it. I think the High Elves should also have access to the Avari Spearmen. Though not the other Avari units. It's only the Spearmen that those elves can get. Behind them, I have put their visual armor upgrade, so they take on the red and gold armor with a black kind of plate here on the shield with another gold plate. They look very excellent. Weapons are pretty much the same, but I just love the progression in this game, and I love how good all the units look with this more Quendi styled armor. So they do get a significant stat buff going up to 25 total defense there. And then the Avari Warriors also pick up the same style uh, same type of armor here, but they also get that visual upgrade. The next unit does not get a visual upgrade, and that is because, well, they are Avari Shadows. They are pretty equivalent to the Athala Rangers, slightly less range, more movement speed, and uh, same amount of missiles, but exceptional accuracy, so they're even more deadly than the Athala Rangers, though they are harder to get. They also come with better melee, better missile, and better total defense. 
Uh, they can hide anywhere, but uh, apparently they're not reliable in woods, so take that as you will. Uh, an excellent unit. Uh, they definitely more than make up for the fact that you don't get the Fallen Rangers if you get the Avari Shadows, so a great, great unit to have there. A great bowman, but not the best bowman we're about to get there. We are going to talk about the Morquendi Sentinels, the elven equivalent of the knights, and that they are your unit with the stakes. These are Norway's bodyguard. They are 9 melee, 9 missile, with 24 total defense, very high accuracy, which is lower than the shadows, but still it's excellent. You can consider that, that their armor is making them less accurate, but their arrows do more damage. 32 missiles, slightly less range, but these guys are absolute monsters, both in melee and at range, and you've got to love the detail and work that went into their models. They look very, very good, so... An excellent unit to have. Nuri will have you replenishing bodyguard of these. Though keep in mind, they are very expensive to field. I want to see you reaching the 500s for upkeep at this tier of unit quality. But they are well worth the price. And then next, a contender for one of the best pike units in the entire game. Definitely up there. The Moriquendi Protectors. An 8 attack pike. 6 charge is actually quite solid. With 24 total defense, very long spears, good against mounts, all the things that pikes are. They make it almost impenetrable wall, and it's just kind of cool that they have these curved kind of blades at the end there. I don't know how effective that is for a pike, but uh, these guys are absolutely deadly. They will get tons of kills in a battle, and anything fighting them from the front, like, unless it's another equivalently strong pike unit, like, no one's getting through the protector's in the front unless they're like a troll or something like that. Trolls, elephants, those sort of things. As we saw in my last video when I ran cave trolls through more Quendi protectors. But that would be their only real weakness. And that's a, that's a thing that trolls have going for them anyway. Against Rune, you really have nothing to worry about. Have these guys in your front line. Have them protect your flanks. Whatever you want. As long as they're not getting hit by the crossbows. Which are your only real worry with them. They will pretty much never really... They won't really die in combat. You'll take a couple of losses per battle. If that, as long as you don't let them get flanked or overrun. Finally, going into the last unit, we're at the end here. The Avari Naharim. This is Avalon's bodyguard, a 9, 7, and 5 charge cavalry unit there. So 7 missile, 9 melee, 17 total defense, no shield, but 10 armor. Excellent morale. They have a bonus against the Cataphract cavalry with high accuracy and 30 missiles. These guys also get the visual armor upgrade, so they're not like the shadows in that regard. They do get the golden and red clothed armor there, which is just absolutely beautiful with the kind of curved elven blades. They are absolutely, absolutely incredibly powerful. And oftentimes you can have Avalon take out like half stack armies alone just between the arrow fire and then charging the cavalry unit into runic troops. So he is a very powerful bodyguard, but you can say the same for Edwardin and having the Vintner Court Paladin. So that's pretty much it for Dorwinian. Um, we've definitely talked a lot about them. This is definitely one of the longer videos, but they do have a lot going on. There has been some discussion, and let me know what you guys would think about this. Is Would you want Dorwinian's recruitment to be completely open? And by that, would you want there to be a way where, say... Through script progression, you eventually unlock both tiers of units, or do you like the way that there's replayability in the campaign, and you get restricted to only one side of your, like, army, basically? Like, you still get all of the units. Like, for, if you have, uh, if you choose elves to go into the economy, you'll still get a unit of more plenty protectors, warriors, you'll get avalanche and the harem, the shadows, you still get one of all the units, you just don't get the capability to train them anywhere. So really, that's the only restriction, is not being able to train your units anywhere. I think it's interesting. I would kind of prefer to be able to have both the Vintner Court Knights and Paladins fighting alongside the Elves. That's just me. It would make you a very powerful nation, but I don't see anything wrong with that. In my personal opinion, I think it would be really cool if they... You, put, you basically chose one side first, and then through progression, like maybe you defeat ruin or capture Mistrand, then you unlock the other side. I think that could make it interesting, but then you lose some of that what makes Dorinian special and have their own replayability. So anyway, looking at the next faction, they are battling us here. The Knights of Arthodyne, the Dunatane, will be the next faction, so they will be up next week. 
and I will be basically covering the Dunedain as both the Reunited Kingdom and Arnor, so both the factions will be put together under one. I expect that to be a longer video since there's a lot to talk about there. Though I've done update videos in the past on their faction since they were the main focus of version 5, so I'm not, I'm not really exactly sure. Uh, I'll go in depth. It'll be a proper overview video. Um, and we'll talk about the differences in Arnor, the differences for the Reunited Kingdom, the standard units you can get either way. Uh, because there were comments asking, hey, what about Arnor and, and such, and I hear you. Arnor will be coming, but they will be coming under the Dunedain, which is better than me waiting for, like, say, the Northern Dunedain. I didn't want to push them out that long into the list, so I have a bit of bias there. So we'll get to um, the Dunedain next week, and then shortly after that, I believe I'll be able to squeeze in one more recording, and then there will be one week where there will not be a recording, most likely due to me being overseas. Well, actually, not only really overseas, but I'll be doing some volunteer work, um, part of the GoFundMe and all that. So I will be probably not having a video the week after the Dunedain, but there will be the following week. So there will probably, most likely, be a break. Nothing's for certain that may change uh, as I get into next week. I might find time just to do like a double recording and get both out of the way. But we'll see, because I'll have to start packing up my gear. And it'll be my final exam week, so it's going to be a bit busy for me. So until then, I hope you guys are enjoying version 5, as I've been saying. Hope you enjoy Dorwinian as much as I enjoy Dorwinian, because they are an absolutely beautiful faction. What happened to the Bogard? They just got absolutely destroyed. I wonder what was that? It must have been the Steel Bowman, huh? They must have just been shooting the, uh, those poor, poor Regent Bogard. In fact, where are their corpses? Were they over here? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they got shot to death or charged by a Royal Guard. Either of the above could have happened to them. But anyway, my friends, that will be it for today's video, and until the next one, farewell.